you want to follow along, go ahead and get out and get ready to the book of Matthew. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, and I'll be starting there at verse number 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and could not speak was brought to Jesus. He healed the man so that he could both speak and see. The crowd was amazed and asked, Could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and replied, Any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he's divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too. So they will condemn you for what you have said. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes. How can even men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasure of their good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy and perfect word. Blast me against the Holy Spirit. Jesus says here in our text, this is the sin that is unpardonable, unforgivable. And so that's a pretty serious thing. And so it should make each one of us want to question or examine ourselves and make sure the thing to ourselves, boy, I, I hope I haven't done that thing. Because if this is the one thing that Jesus says is unpardonable, we want to take that thing really seriously, don't we? And yet I know that sometimes people are almost tormented by this idea. I remember being young and I think of one person in particular who was so struggled with this idea that perhaps she had done this sin that she just kept asking herself daily, have I done this? Have I done this? And I was almost tormented by this idea. And there's many throughout the history of the world who think to themselves, have I done this thing? Have, have I done something that is so unforgivable that God would not even forgive me? Have I been so much of a, a liar or a pervert or a deceiver or a person full with hate that God would not forgive me, that I am beyond his grace? So what does this mean? Well, let's look back at our passage as we dissect it. I hope that we'll be able to see more clearly what it is Jesus is talking about as we refer back here to Matthew. This is the only time that Jesus really talks about this sin besides the parallel accounts in Mark and Luke as well. And Christians have struggled with this. And sometimes people, even I think of our Bible study a, a, a few months ago, where we can come to slightly different ideas, but I think we have a lot of common ground on what Jesus is talking about here. See, what he begins talking about is a great miracle. As we look again at verse 22, there was a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak, and he was brought to Jesus, and he healed the man so that he could speak and see, and the crowd was amazed. Could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? Jesus performs this miracle. A man who um, couldn't see. He couldn't speak. He didn't have his sanity. And yet Jesus heals him. He cast out this demon and it was to such a degree that 
all the people were amazed. No one could refute that this was a great miracle. It was right there in public and so in your face that even um, the people that saw it, even the people that were opposing Jesus um, were forced to believe in his power. They didn't refute the miracle. They didn't say, ah, oh, there wasn't a miracle. They knew there was a miracle. And so the multitude saw it and they were so amazed. They said, could this be the son of David, which is a title given to the Messiah, the son of God? Now, in our own lives, we don't see miracles all that often. And sometimes we think, well, in the Bible times, they saw miracles all the time. They didn't really see miracles. That's why they were so amazed, because it wasn't every day that they saw someone who couldn't speak, speaking, someone who couldn't see, have their sight again. This was amazing. It was a true miracle of God. And sometimes we think, well, I, I haven't seen too many miracles like that. That's what makes it a miracle. Because it's supernatural. It's beyond the realm of the natural world. It is something beyond the ability of this world to understand that God has intervened, that he has done something supernatural. And sometimes people make the mistake of thinking miracles don't happen. They do. They're just rare, for one. They don't happen all that often. But when they do, when we see something like someone's sight being made whole, we give God all the honor and praise and glory. Because he is so good. But I want to share something with you that beyond these physical healings that are great miracles, God actually does something that is even more miraculous, really. See, God has the ability to restore our relationship with him, to forgive us of our sins. See, when we see a great miracle, someone who had cancer who was healed, Someone who couldn't see and now they have sight. Those are things that are wonderful and praiseworthy. But the human body still breaks down. All those people that are healed in a physical sense still die. Life still ends. But the greatest miracle, the one that is truly eternal, is the, is the miracle that takes place in the human heart, the human mind, the human soul, that Jesus Christ can save us from our own sin and give us a relationship with him. Now, a cynic might say, how convenient. I can see when someone gains their sight. I can see this great physical thing, but I can't see what has transpired inside of another human being. No, we can't. But that doesn't make it any less true. Because you see that you know that if you have accepted Christ, you see the great transformation that has happened in your own life from where you were to who God is shaping you to be. That he is transforming you. You see the effects of that in your life. Jesus said you cannot see the wind, right? You can't see it, but you see the effects. You see it blowing. You feel it. You know it's there, even though you cannot see it. It is there. The miracle of new birth is eternal. And so while Jesus was teaching on this healing, the Pharisees and scribes were there and they saw this physical miracle and they saw the people being moved by this physical miracle that because of it, they were placing their faith in Jesus that he might be the Messiah, the son of David. And so they make a baseless accusation against Jesus. Verse 24, and when the Pharisees heard about this miracle, they said, no wonder he casts out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. The Pharisees didn't question that a miracle took place. It was clear to everyone that this man had a physical miracle. But what was not clear and what they couldn't give up was their power and their influence. And so they had to accuse Jesus of something. So they came up with this absolute baseless lie that what he did was from Satan, not from God. They couldn't deny the miracle, but they say, oh, he's possessed by Satan, or in some translations it will say Beelzebub, which was uh, a pagan god, but at this time among Jewish leaders, they had taken it as a reference to Satan. It's literally referred to as the Lord of the Flies. But that is accusing God of doing something in Satan's name. Despite all this evidence, despite their even knowledge that this miracle had been done, despite them knowing that this was clearly the power of God, they denied it. Their own pursuit of power 
made them accuse Jesus of something that wasn't true. They couldn't even see the absurdity of their own claims, which made no sense. And so Jesus gives them an irrefutable answer. And in fact, gives them three reasons why what they said is absolute nonsense. Beginning in verse 25, he knew their thoughts and replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. If Satan is casting out Satan, he's divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. What you're saying is illogical. You don't fight your own teammate. If you're on the same team, you don't fight each other. That's not going to produce you winning. So if I'm on Satan's team, I wouldn't be fighting Satan. Secondly, he adds that these accusations are inconsistent. Verse 27, and if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so will you condemn them for what you said? You know people are doing the same thing. Do you accuse them, the people among you, of the same thing that you're accusing me of? See, what you're saying is inconsistent. They should have leveled them against their own people, but they refused to do that. And finally, what Jesus is going to say is that it's impossible in verse 29. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his good? Only someone who's stronger. Someone who could tie him up and plunder his house. In this case, Satan is the strong man. If you're strong, right? If someone else is entering into your house, if you're going to subdue someone, you have to be stronger than them. So if I'm going to subdue Satan, I have to be stronger than him. So who's stronger than Satan? God. I must be doing this under my own power. How could Satan subdue Satan? I would have to be stronger. Therefore, the only answer, the only logical conclusion is that Jesus is doing this by the power of God, by the Holy Spirit's leading and direction. However, knowing their thoughts, Jesus again talks to the Pharisees because he knows their hearts were hardened against him. That despite all the evidence of what was clearly in front of them, they absolutely refused to believe because they didn't want to. And so this is when Jesus accuses them of this unforgivable sin. Verse 31, so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Jesus adds, in this age or in the age to come, this word blasphemy, it means to speak against. It's a very serious crime in Judaism to speak against who God is. And Jesus is applying it to the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity of God. Now, what is he saying here? It's not simply saying something bad against the Holy Spirit, right? Because even Paul did that, right? We look at uh, 1 Timothy 1. Paul writes, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my isolation, I persecuted people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. But how generous and gracious God was. He filled me with faith and love that came from Jesus Christ. Paul said that he had blasphemed in the past, so it wasn't just something said. So let's consider other sins in the New Testament. We see many times tax collectors and sinners ha had come to Jesus from all kinds of things. We think of the woman um, caught in adultery in, in John 8. We think of the sinful woman um, coming to Jesus in, in Luke 7. And Jesus covered their sins. He forgave them. We think about Peter, right? Who Jesus told him, you're going to deny knowing me. When I need you the most, when I am on trial, you're going to curse and say, you don't even know who I am. And Jesus forgave Peter. In fact, he made him the keynote speaker at the day of Pentecost. What about murderers? Lots of murderers were used by God that God forgave them. Paul was involved in watching murders and probably involved in the persecution that led to many murders in his life. And yet, Paul tells us in Acts, or it was said about him in Acts, I should say, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Or the people were told, that's not Paul, I'm sorry, I misspoke. But the people were told to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, even murder can be forgiven by God. That all these sins can be forgiven for who God is except 
blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So then what is he talking about? He's not talking about a word spoken, but he's talking about this total and complete denial. He's talking about attributing the work of God to Satan. He's talking about saying that the things that are God's realm is given over to Satan. He's talking about denying that the Holy Spirit has the ability to forgive sins, the refusal to admit that we are in fact sinners, the refusal to lay aside our sense of self-righteousness, to wash away that fake sense of self and accept Jesus Christ, to trust Him as Lord and Savior. See, the Pharisees had hardened their heart. They, they even accused Jesus of doing work for Satan because they knew in their hearts what was true. They could see it. The evidence was in front of them, but they refused to believe it. The evidence didn't matter to them because of what they wanted. They had refused to accept that. See, it's about rejecting Christ to the degree that the Pharisees knew that Jesus really was the Son of God, and yet they chose not to believe it. They chose not to accept it. They refused to allow themselves to be seen as sinners who needed grace because they thought they didn't need it. They were better than the other people around them. And the reality is they weren't. They refused to admit that they needed to trust in Jesus, who reject the gospel not because they haven't heard it, but they have heard it, and they know at the center of their being that it is true. But they say, I don't want it. And that is the saddest thing in the world. To know something is true, but to allow fear or anxiety or their own desires to say, I don't want to accept the truth. And to walk away and do their own thing. And their hearts become hardened over that. You see, God didn't create robots. He gave us choices. He could have forced all of us to accept who he is, but he didn't do that. He gave us a will, our choice to accept him or to reject him. And we can all do that the same as the Pharisees. The choice is up to us. Jesus has proven over and over again in his word that he is worthy to be praised that he deserves to be accepted as the one who can save us from our sin, because we've all sinned. We've all done things away from God's perfect will. And he deserves to be the Lord of our lives, the one who is perfect. And yet he's so good and so accepting. If you've never accepted Jesus, what is stopping you today? If you've never allowed him to come in and say, I want Jesus to be my savior. I know that I am not perfect. I know I am not like these Pharisees. Don't let it be like them and sit there and think in a chair, you know what, I don't need you, God, because this, 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 I've done. I'm okay, I'm good, I know this, I've read this. I have this information in my head. I've done this in my past. I've had those experiences. Those things don't matter if we don't confess that we have sinned against the holy and perfect God and are willing to make him our savior. And then secondly, to come and say, you know what, Jesus, you deserve to be the Lord of my life. You're the person who knows all things. You know more than me. And so the decisions that are in my life and the leading of my life should be on the direction of your spirit because you know more than me. You see, I think of Paul as an example of someone who heard that gospel message. He talked about being the chief of sinners. He talked about all the things that he had done, and then he talks about all the things he thought he had done that he held on that he thought these are good things that God will be proud of. And then he realized that they're all just filthy rags. They're nothing. And so he had to release them and rely on grace. To save him. So, I don't know how strongly more I could say this than if you've never accepted Jesus, don't put it off another day. Because he loves you. We think, I can't. Well, it's too late now, you know. I, I've been sitting here in this church for 20 years. 
I can't. If I tell someone publicly that I need to accept Jesus now, they're going to think, why didn't I do it a long time ago? Why do we all have excuses. We all have things. Maybe you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you know in the last six months you haven't really been following Him that close. Just admit it. He is so good and so forgiving. He will forgive you. Because if you're worried that you've blasphemed, if He's still calling and convicting your heart, your heart is not too hardened for His love. He will forgive you. He will. You just have to humble yourself. <sighs> Don't think, well, good, I haven't committed this unpardonable sin yet. So there's still time. There is still time. But none of us know how long we have left. Unfortunately, people die every single day. Accidents happen and other things, and none of us know how long we have. So don't think, oh, I'll, I'll wait till I'm really sick, or I'll wait till I'm a little older to accept Jesus. I don't know what we're afraid of. That we can't change? That I can't be different than I am? That I won't be able to be good enough for God? You will. Because if you mean it, He will help shape you. You're not going to be perfect. You'll never be perfect on this earth, but that God will take you where you are and He will lead you to where He wants you to be. You don't have to be good enough first. You don't have to clean up your life to a certain degree first. You don't have to do anything except to acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need His grace, and that you want Him to be the one that makes the shots, who calls your life. Friends, if you've never done that, I cannot, before I left, next week, I, I couldn't leave without at least saying those things to you. That it is the greatest thing you could ever do. <sighs> so I assure you that there is no sin that if God is laying on your part, that he is, he is drawing you. When we pray, that when we sing our last hymns, just come up and pray. Someone will come and pray with you. If there's anything that you're like, well, I'm already a Christian, yes, but you know there's something that you're holding back from God, some avenue of your life. Just give it to Him. Don't allow our pride or our selfishness or our self-righteousness to hold us back. Just give it all to Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, I ask that each person here today, that we would know that we need you. God, if there's anyone here that's never acknowledged you as Savior, wishes to serve you as Lord, Lord, that you would lay it so clearly on our hearts that we would have no other choice but to acknowledge it, to look, to, to make a decision about our souls today. And if there's any sin in our hearts, show us, reveal it. So maybe even for the first time we can see it. For the first time we see how what we've done is wrong. Show us that so that we can repent. Show us how great of a debt we owe you because you have been so faithful, so willing to forgive. Father God, if there's any person here who has acknowledged you as Savior but is still so holding back actually obeying you, that is really so afraid to really trust you that they don't put it off, that they just keep hearing your kind invitation and that you would just keep drawing them to respond. Tug at our hearts. Know that there is still hope. Know that you are inviting us to come and to lay your, our sins at your feet. Heavenly Father, if there is any who hear this sermon who have not entered into a personal relationship with you, Lord, I pray that by your will and your work that you would bring forth the miracle of salvation that is present by the authority of your word that your Holy Spirit would take residence into each one of our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.